Hello, it's me Kyle. Welcome back to Give Paws Hobby, the channel where I stop to appreciate the things I love to fill my free time with. And what else would, do I love to fill my free time with more than these days uh, than the Old King's Crown? Uh, just a fantastic, beautiful, compelling uh, game that, depending on when you're seeing this, is maybe just recently up for um, uh, funding on Kickstarter. Link down below in the description. Um, and this is the part two of our SWAT, our SWAT's All of This About uh, series, where now we're talking about the ideas. Part one, link up here in the corner, was about the stuff. So the components, the theme, um, just what makes it, you know, we all, I think as board gamers, love that tactile enjoyment and just all the work that gets poured into the theming of the game. Um, but good theme does not a good game necessarily make. And that's what today, the ideas is all about. So all the things that make the game tick, all those gears uh, kind of getting their teeth together. So. Uh, without any further ado, we're gonna dive right in. I've, I've boiled it down to five things that I, I really think um, speak volumes of the game itself. Now, uh, there's a couple things that this is not. This is not an overall review of the game. Um, it's just uh, me talking about cool and interesting and worthwhile aspects of the design. Um, it's also not in any possible way objective. Uh, pretty much nothing on this channel is, but just to be clear, this is me subjectively gushing about a game that I love. Um, and just to be further clear, the only reason I'm able to do this with the components in hand is because I was lucky enough to be sent a prototype copy from Eerie Idle Games. Um, so thank you for sending that across the pond to me. Um, I have been absolutely falling deeper and deeper in love with this game and um, the fact that I can do it in real life as opposed to uh, TTS makes a huge difference in that. So um, I wanna take advantage of my opportunity and share it with you uh, it, to see if this is a game you might be interested in uh, checking out. So without any further ado, let's get into the first, uh, the first category, which I uh, entitled Clarity and Depth. All right, what you see in front of you is the beating heart of what makes these factions these factions. So you have the follower cards, you have the sites of power, first player or the player order tokens, you have the boards over there, these myth cards. Um, the only thing that you're not seeing, which we will get to in just a second, are the tactics cards, which go into the faction boards. Um, so when I say clarity and depth, what I'm talking about is the fact that among all these cards, whereas most games you might look at this and say, oh my gosh, my brain's already swimming. I bet there's going to be, there's four very different factions. I bet these are all going to have different blocks of text, thinking like the magic concept of like having to grok what's going on in all these different cards. But I'm happy to tell you that's not the case. So on this stack, for instance. These are all nine strength. They are all captains of the supporter types. They are of the four different factions. So you see four different names, four different uh, images. Remember, this is the art incomplete prototype. So these may or may not be the pieces of art they use for them. Um, right now, there some of them are using doing double duty. Um, but the actual, the strength and the keywords, the abilities on the card are identical. Also, there's flavor text because this game is beautiful in every single possible freaking way. Um, every one of these piles, aside from this one, don't pay attention to that one, or these goofy ones off to the side, aside from this one, every one of these other piles is that way. So you have a different type, you have a different strength, if there is a strength, um, and then the keywords, the, the abilities, are the same. Now. <laughs> you might be thinking, okay, well, I see the clarity part <laughs> because there's a lot of uh, continuity. There's a lot of similarity between these factions, um, which is true in this respect. The depth comes into the fact that these keywords are going to provide so many different ways to interact with the game space that the clarity is actually hugely beneficial that you don't have to 
remember that, you know, someone's playing the purple faction or the red faction or the green faction. So I think I remember they have a lot more cards that do this or they have a lot more ability to bolster each other's strength. No, no, no. Every single card, again, minus this one or the, the myth cards over here are the same, which allows you to focus on the, the meaning, the, the value and the worth of these keywords and then using your own deck as the example, you can kind of figure out what the other players might be doing. The clarity of having these similar piles allows the depth of what you're going to do with them to shine. And it's such a fantastic element of the game, um, but it's also an opportunity to show off how the, 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 the lore and the theming of the different factions, I mean, the, here are their heirs. This is one of the cards that they start with at the beginning of the game. Uh, you know, arguably one of the most like thematically important parts of the faction. And it's the same strength, it's the same type, and it's the same keywords, which is perfectly fine. Everybody knows you start with kind of like a big bad in your faction and it's always gonna start in the game. You don't have to worry about what the difference is between that. Because again, over here, and we'll get to that in a little bit, then those differences do stick out. Speaking of clarity and depth, something as simple as turn order. So whoever has the most influence, all the way down to whoever has the least. And if there's ever a tie, you flip going into the next year. Such a critical part of the game, because up here, you get first dibs, but that means you have to show your hand before anybody else, as in they get to see where you're putting your cards, where you're putting your companies, what actions you're taking. You have to go first, which means every other player can respond to your actions. And last but not least, if you are the lowly person in last place, you get to decide what order things happen, what what regions get resolved first in the as the uh, the turn goes into autumn. And it's such a simple thing that provides so much, not just tactical, but strategic depth that I, I can't stress how fantastic it feels. Um, I'm just gonna go on <laughs> because I'm just gonna keep saying the same thing over and over. So the next part I'm talking about growth and loss. Okay, when I say growth and loss, one of the biggest ways I'm talking about growing isn't actually talk, doing anything with your deck at all. It's interacting with these kingdom cards. So in the game, you'll have 20 of these. There are this many other cards that aren't even in the game at any given time. So think Pax Pamir, where depending on what cards are or are not in the game, it's gonna have a completely different feel. So these cards, uh, are going to provide you with some abilities. The ability to just get your myth just for free, but you need to control this to keep control of that myth. Also, nice name drop, boys. You can take this to rearrange the order track. So that thing that, that I just talked about, how important it was, you can just decide to do it differently. Now, these cards are are hugely powerful, and, the, and Eerie Idol has said, that they have put no effort into uh, normalizing them or, or making them even. There are going to be better or stronger cards in this deck. There are also going to be cards that might be stronger if there were a different situation going on. So situationally, some of these might be absolutely game-breaking as opposed to other ones which are like meh or have literally no effect at all. If you already have your myth, this means nothing to you. But if you're a person who has put no effort into it and this comes up on the great road, you might see an, a, a pathway to getting something that you never thought you were gonna have that game. And the fact that these are out there and completely imbalanced and completely situational means that it is gets pushed onto the players about how they pursue or ignore these cards depending on where they think they would need to, to add them into their strategies. It's, it's just incredible. And just because you have it doesn't mean it's gonna stay there. Someone else can take it back. How many other deck builder or you know tableau builder sort of games can people just say, that thing over there I like and it's mine now. And I think that's super compelling. The other thing, the loss part. So right here, 
where you see the little cards, the beginning of the game, you're gonna slot that in because your hand size is six. Again, just the the build quality and the design of the the, the components, these are the prototype ones and they look this good. It's it's just awesome to hold and to to, <laughs> to be around. Um, but this, every time you go through your deck, normally the deck builder thing is to churn through your deck so you can get to your new cards as quick as possible. So much so that typically new cards go into your discard, so you won't even see them until you've shuffled. But in this game, once you shuffle, you are going to lose one size to your hand. So it went from six down to five. Now, the game comes with a number of these tiles, goes as high as 10, which I'm gonna be honest, I have not seen a situation where that's come anywhere close. And as low as three, which I'm also gonna be honest, I have made sure that I never get anywhere close to this because that is terrifying. But it, it, it kind of gives you the impression that just because you're building up strength and you are fostering you know, this army or this support for your cause does not mean it comes without cost. That the, the you know, entropy of, of running this big organization of trying to take control of the kingdom is real. And if you just kind of churn through your supporters and your network, that sure, you might get to those awesome cards more, but you're going to be seeping the other cards, these other things, out of your deck, and that is not without negative consequences. Okay, so back to the thing I said I was gonna talk about later, asymmetry. So the, it should come as no surprise, I'm a fan of asymmetry. This channel was started on Root. Um, I love Spirit Island. I love, I love the, honestly, one of my favorite parts of John Company is where you divide up those starting cards to see who starts the game with what resources. It, it just kind of like sets the stage for something. And then the rest of the game, everyone, it's all egalitarian. You know, whatever you can get, you can get, but you start in a very different way. This game treats asymmetry in a really interesting way because some of the asymmetry is sort of locked behind a bit of a, not a paywall, but like an effort wall. There is some asymmetry, for instance, right here, tax collector, grizzled general, hexer, and spy master. So these are the collaborator abilities for each of the factions, and they are, just from the, the beginning of the game, these are going to be different. Now, that said, you need to go seek out the collaborator to actually put it here and spend it to even use this. So again, it's locked behind effort. It is asymmetry, but it is kind of uh, not immediately accessible. Now, another way that the asymmetry is immediately interjected in the game are these tactics tiles. So for each, uh, for each faction, aside from ambush, each one has an ambush that they can use where they can swap card positions, which is incredibly powerful in a game like this, as you might imagine. But they have three other tactics, which are extremely different. And I'm not just saying like, oh, you know, plus three strength to a captain card. Oh, someone else must have plus three strength to a, you know, shield card, whatever the shield cards are called. Uh, followers, there it is. Um, no, 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 these are totally different. This is searching for your War Machine card. And you get to search for it again from anywhere, not just from your discard pile or your draw pile. So that means like back from the lost. That's really different. No other faction has stuff that's like that. So we have one that's the same, three that are different, which, okay, so far, so, you know, asymmetry, we get it. But if we look on the back, they each have a way to reactivate the cards. One of them up here is the quest like strength. So you can send a quest to card, your site of power, and spend that to reactivate this tactic. So now you can spend ambush again. However, the other way, it says, or, gives another way that you can reactivate your tactic. And each faction has like a different or. So we have paying influence, 
We have discarding cards from your draw pile. We have burning cards from your lost pile as an out of the game and moving three companies to the reserve. So companies that were on your board that you could send out to battle, just getting rid of them, paying with companies. So you're paying with different opportunity costs, depending on what faction you are. And typically it's a faction that that's what you want to be doing, not want to be doing, but that's probably immaterial to you where you have more influence or you want to get through your draw pile or you don't care about cards in your lost pile or you don't necessarily put your strength in your companies. Asymmetry in the way that you repay for to, to, to use again your asymmetric tactics is just super interesting. Then over here we have the cards I pointed to before, your four decrees. So again, same card type, all of them are invulnerable which is important because that means the card is not going to be cheesed out of the game. And they do something completely different, tied intrinsically to what the faction is and what they're trying to do. Um, these cards are, again, right from the beginning of the game, these are in your deck. However, there is no guarantee that they're going to be in your opening hand. So in order to get this other part of asymmetry, you need to put effort in. Now, I neglected to say on the tactics tiles, there is not an effort cost to use this. They all start face up on your player board. However, as soon as you use it and it gets flipped over, then for some of them, you have to pay something in order to do it again. Now, for some of them, once you flip it over, it gives you a new ability entirely. And lastly, the myth cards off to the side here. So these are the cards that are going to be locked underneath your faction's site of power. And again, the growth part of this is not just a guaranteed thing. There are going to be games when you don't see a pathway or a need or a desire to go to that, that site of power to unlock these cards. However, this is really the only way for three of the factions to add cards to your actual deck. Remember, the Kingdom cards just get added to your board. They become new asymmetric abilities. But these Myth cards, they get added into your actual deck that are going to be in your hand as you draw them later on. Now, some of them have just one. Some of them have multiples. The Gathering is the, the strangest. So you have to do extra work to unlock the strongest card in the game. But you also have these other two cards that you can unlock in a different way, a totally unique fashion that none of the other factions have. So the asymmetry, again, is couched in this effort that it takes to either get the cards, to maintain the cards, or to repower the cards to use again. And it makes it so that, that you're kind of living as this faction. The asymmetry is like built into your code but it's not necessarily something that you're hammering every single time. Like the, the factions in Root, your asymmetry is in the order of your birdsong, your daylight, and your evening. And it's just, that's not what's happening here. You are kind of getting your asymmetry in your planning and your preparation and your reaction to what's going on. And it's just beautiful. All right, so I came back from the table because these last two categories really don't need me to show components. Um, I'll probably be showing some just like B-roll on the screen anyways, but the first one, uh, the name came to me as a parent. Uh, I've been told this by a number of people. The days are long, but the years are short. And that refers to, you know, some days are harder than others. And you're just like, I just cannot wait until the kids are to bed um, so I can do something else aside from making sure that they stay safe and healthy and happy. Um, but then suddenly you blink and they're a year older. And you're just like, what just happened? All I wanted was to get to bedtime and then they're a year older. And so it's pretty much like a, you know, don't wish time to go too quickly sort of thing, which is true for any parents out there. I hear you, I see you, you got this. But anyways, um, in the game format, this is, uh, not really anything that's like programmed into the old king's crown this is completely something that i perceive some games having 
And it is this concept or this, this like perception rather that the game is taking longer than it actually is. And the, the, to me, some of my favorite game experiences are when I am happily enjoying myself. Like I'm having a great time, but you know, every so often when my brain kind of lands on like, I wonder how long it's been. And I'm just like, I don't really care, but probably a while. And then I get done with the game and it's been 70 minutes or, you know, less than an hour or you know for a game that i thought was easily multiple hours long it was like 90 minutes or just under two you know the the sort of thing where time sort of telescopes in the moment just seems like the decisions are requiring you to do this thousand fold thought about what is the best play and in the you know the the meta on like the ten thousand foot view really not that much is happening and I think this game absolutely embodies that so fantastically. The fact that there are only three regions, so there are only three clashes, and then, you know, the Great Road one afterwards, makes it so each, each year, which is broken up into the seasons, goes pretty quick. And you get to the end of a year, and you're just like, or rather the end of the game, and you look back and you realize, we've only gone through five, sometimes four, maybe six. I mean, I typically play on skirmish, which is only up to 15 points. So I'm probably finishing a little bit faster than the average game, especially a multiplayer game. There's gonna be a lot more of that attrition in longer 20 point games with four people vying for control. Um, but the game for me, from a solo perspective, I'm easily imagining it taking 90 minutes to close to two hours just from how it feels in the moment. And again, I'm perfectly happy with it. And then when I actually look at it, it's like 45 minutes. And that's with me, especially earlier on, checking pretty much every time, every move in the rule book. So this, this, this perception um, of time taking longer, sort of like a TARDIS, like there's more space <laughs> on the inside than on the outside. And the, the, the Old King's Crown, other games like it, are like a board game TARDIS. Like the time seems to expand bigger than it possibly could because it's only a certain amount of like space or amount of time. But yeah, that's me rambling that the game feels long in a wonderful way and then isn't. Again, as a three or four player game, I could easily see this taking a decent amount longer than I'm playing as a solo game. So just be warned, I'm not, this is not me saying all games will only be 45 minutes long. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just a, a really fun experience whenever I play a game that winds up that way. Um, so lastly, the uh, I could not go through this without um, calling specific attention to the simulacrum. So some extremely suspicious fog. Um, this is such a a wonderfully surprising aspect of the game that. Um, I mean, with a game like this, sometimes you, you see other games where solo mode is sort of an afterthought. It's like, oh, I bet if we like came up with a deck or you know a way to roll dice, then you could emulate a, an opponent well enough. And great, we'll throw it in there. Uh, our, our two to six player game is now one to six. Nailed it. This game, first of all, is not that. But secondly, it's not that because it couldn't be. Like th there's no way that this could just be you know, you, you flip over a, uh, or, or you're just like blind drawing from the top of a deck and rolling a die to see which region it goes into and you flip it over and you say, oh, wow, that, like, you came up good against that one or, oh, that was a tie, like, that would still, that would be the tacked on solo mode that essentially some other games kind of do. And you would still, sometimes, even in those games, I do enjoy the, the ability to just live in the world a little bit to try out the different factions but even if i did like enjoy it just a little bit that doesn't last long because there's not depth there's not there's not replayability to it the simulacrum made by ricky royal is a masterpiece for this type of a game the way that it the way that it it kind of encapsulates 
just a little bit of knowability. You know, when you're playing against other players, you know them, you know their personalities, you know their beefs that they might have with you or other players, and you can use that against them, or try to use it against them, in the course of the game. Where you can say, you know what, I think it would make sense for them to put this, their strongest card this year into the Highlands because they want to get me out of the court or whatever, but they really hate what that other player just did to them. So I feel like they're instead gonna go to where they put their Herald and they're just gonna take the pain to them. And I think, you know, fingers crossed, I think I'm gonna be able to get by with maybe not so much of a clash up in the Highlands and you can maintain the court. Now, that you might be completely wrong. <laughs> or if you're playing a multiplayer game, you might have been right about that one player, but not the other one. <laughs> so um, there's the, the, the uh, thought processes are, are you know, branching and long. Um, but in the solo mode, the, the aspect of that with the, the gold, silver, and bronze cards, and then the fog cards being kind of the dark horse as like, going first, but going into sometimes a weird place where you wouldn't have anticipated them. Sometimes you flip it over and it's a just a, you know, brick house of a, of a supporter with just huge strength. Sometimes it's something with like middle like area strength, but then the effect, especially if that advanced effect takes place, is the absolute worst thing that you could have possibly imagined. Other times, it's a really small or non-existent number that just says, this ties whatever. And so it it can just respond to whatever you put out there and then it will force another tiebreaker. Um, but then the way that the, the rider and the speaker are uh, taking over for the going out and questing and getting authority into the courts, the way that they get different rewards for the different regions, but then the, I mean, that's all fantastic. What I, everything that I just said would already have been a really good game. I mean, the, the reason that I love playing Pax Pamir solo essentially is what I just talked about. There is a, an, an as, in that game, there's a little bit less aspect of no ability. You can know somewhat of what Wakan will wanna do um, in terms of like how they uh, prioritize strength in a region, but there's a little bit more no ability here. But that's not it. That isn't, you know, that would be a, a good solo mode, but what makes this a great and a, a, a amazingly <laughs> great solo mode is the fact that they have added in this, this deck of modifications, um, and then the fog cards themselves are named, and they've just sort of opened up this, this kind of Pandora's box, in a, but in a good way. Because Pandora, I don't think that was a, that wasn't a, a net positive when that was opened. But in this, it is. Because they, they have the, the generic kind of easy, normal, and hard uh, simulacrums, but then they have the archetypes where they tell you which mods to use and which fog cards to use, and then how many companies they're gonna use. Um, and they have four of them in the rule book, but it provides you on the next page a simple way for you to make whatever type of simulacrum you want. And I think this is just genius. I mean, imagine if um, I talked about John Company's the starting cards, like how you make your initial tableau of like resources or abilities that you start the game with. Imagine if Root was started that way. Instead of the different factions, you had just like abilities and then you either randomly or you drafted for them and then you like clicked them into your player board and you're like, whoa, I'm starting with this one. And that would be, you know, just like an endlessly wild and most likely broken system. There's a reason why that's not the way that's done. Um, but that would give you a huge... Uh, or maybe just the clockworks work that way. Um, and, and then you could say, all right, you're building your clockwork opponent. But that's, again, not what that's for. The clock, the root bots are meant to sort of be like the representation of a player playing that faction. 
there is no such thing in, in the old king's crown. This is just a creepy clockwork, like sputtering cloud, uh, like fog cloud that's coming out of the highlands or the lowlands or through the woods and looks kind of like someone but isn't quite them. And you can come up with all the lore and you can say, I want someone that's gonna be just an absolute terror on the battlefield or mess with the court stuff or be weird and reactive or be, easy you can make them easy and you can do that by exactly what i talked about with that fictitious root thing you can click all these different parts into a imaginary tableau and that's your opponent and i think it's just genius i've likened it to the way that um way back in the old mega man like nes mega man your save was just like that grid of letters and numbers and when you put it in it took you exactly where you left off there's a marvel of of uh coding that you know all the the variables how much health you had uh what things you'd unlocked what levels were done with all of that was captured in however many digits were in there and this can kind of do the same thing where anybody can come up with a simulacrum archetype and they can just put it up online. They could text it to their friend. They could write it down on a paper and somebody sees it at a game night. Like, ooh, I haven't played one like that. Snap a picture and they can do it at home. And they can get that experience whenever they want, whoever they are, wherever they are. So that just like customization that's capable with this system and the the way that you could share it, the way you could replicate things that you've seen or you've heard other people, it's, I've never experienced a solo mode this robust. And, um, and, and it's just so fun. <laughs> it's a, there, are, there are moments when you, when, you, when you really feel like you're having to th like think into what another player is thinking. And I'm sorry, but like, that's just not the experience that I get in almost any other solo game. In, when I'm playing the root bots, I am playing an aspect of roulette. I do not know what type of card they're gonna flip over. I know maybe the roughly the borders, the boundaries of what they could do depending on what they flip over, but that's just pure chance. In John Company, I know the the crown is going to respond if I am have a high strength in this area is gonna respond in a certain way. And so I can kind of uh, proactively uh, hedge my bets in different ways that way but at a certain point that solo rule book is so deep that there's going to be something I do that's going to affect it in a way I didn't anticipate and then you know we're into a different territory there but at the end of the day if I was smart enough to remember everything I could probably predict a lot of what happens in the John Company solo again I love playing John Company solo as well this is something I've never experienced. And maybe dozens of games down the road, when I know, uh, I, not because I memorized it, but just from experience, I know exactly what the range of strength is for the gold, the silver, and the bronze cards. And I know exactly which supporter icons are in which of those card backs. There will be a little bit of kind of peeking behind the curtains and it will cheapen the experience. But that is me using extremely strong language for something I frankly don't think will ever happen. I think it, it, having that little bit of knowability makes this solo mode just incredible. And I can't wait to play it more and over and over. And eventually when I you know, get my reward um, for backing it to play the actual published version over and over and over, and it's just, yeah, that's why I took way longer than any of the other ones to talk about this one category. So um, I've blabbed on long enough. Uh, if, you, if you've made it this far, sound off down below with um, your favorite solo experience um, because there are some great ones out there, but trust me when I say, I know many of you have not been lucky enough to try this yet this is one of those great ones. It, it really, truly is. Um, 
And if you're interested in seeing more about that, um, links up here to my hour long teach <laughs> of, of all the, the components, the rules, a quick overview of the turn, a deep overview of the edge cases, and then a example turn. Uh, eventually, I also want to um, put together a full playthrough of the solo mode. Um, when I'm not sure when that's gonna happen, but I'm not gonna say soon TM, but at some time TM. So with that, um, Thank you, Eerie Idle Games, for sending me the copy. I can't thank you enough, frankly. Um, and thanks you for thanks you for watching. Um, and thanks for taking a pause with Give Pause. And we'll see you next time.